like how we're doing in terms of recruiting folks to participate in this group. And, you know, I know that Melissa, you and Anessa had maybe started to reach out to some people and what their level of interest is and that kind of stuff, or if they had concerns, you know, kind of where we're, where we're going with that. Anessa, maybe you want to go first. Sure. I'm not sure if I should introduce myself. I see more people joining, and I think we have not met before. James, hi. Okay, yeah. Anessa, go ahead. And then, James, you're going to have to introduce yourself too. And Melissa, and yes, anyway, go, <laughs> Anessa. <laughs> <laughs> hi, everyone. Excited to be here. My name is Anessa, originally from Ukraine, born and raised, currently living in Southwest Florida. I am, I've been a part of the scientific Python community for almost five years now. And currently I'm a contributor experience lead for the NumPy project. I, as part of my role, I started looking into metrics, or indicators to, to measure my progress in my current role and came across chaos then connected with Matt and Sean, and uh, here we are. Uh, we've started a working group dedicated to discussing, measuring, identifying helpful metrics for community health within the open size, open source projects. And I guess uh, the question was updates on how we are communicating about this group. We had several conversations at the PyCon US in Salt Lake City. We are continuing these conversations. We also, Melissa and I, just uh, yesterday and the day before participated at GitHub Maintainer Summit. This is an initiative uh, from GitHub. May is maintainers month now. And mm -hmm. we participated in the breakout session dedicated to community health metrics given that GitHub serves all kinds of open source communities, most project, projects that represented were not from open science, but we identified some candidates and I reached out to them. So hopefully they'll be able to join one of our meetings in the nearest future. Okay. That's all for me. Okay. Um, Melissa, maybe you introduce yourself too. Yeah, so um, hi, my name is Melissa. I'm based in Brazil. I have been leading this work that Inessa was mentioning before. So we have a grant from CCI, um, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, to work on contributor experience for NumPy, SciPy, Mathplotlib, and Pandas, which are four of the biggest projects on scientific Python um, land, um, you know, data science, scientific computing, and all of that stuff. So we have been working on contributor experience, onboarding new people, helping uh, streamline policies and improve documentation, that kind of stuff inside the projects. And part of this work is also to kind of come up with metrics and trying to understand if there's anything we can do to measure progress about the, these things. So anything from community health to DEI initiatives to onboarding to community belonging and, you know, it, is my community welcoming and all of that, that is very hard to measure. So um, I think that's our, our main goal is to try to come up with ideas on how to even know if we are making progress and moving forward or not, and how we are in relation to other projects. Um, as far as outreach, I have uh, talked to people more individually than uh, like sending broad messages. Uh, I think there's a couple of people that I mentioned, they were pretty interested, but still, I think it's a weird time. There's a lot of conferences happening right now in Python world. <laughs> there's uh, a lot of stuff going on. People are traveling. So it may be that we have new people joining in the future. At least that that was most of my feedback is that a lot of people are busy right now, but they are interested in the outputs and potentially also participating in the conversation. So. Um, not many concrete outputs, but that's no, what it that's, is. no that, that actually that's helpful just in the sense of it, you know, makes me think too that as we are 
producing metrics or models that are helpful in like Melissa, your and Anessa's, you know, your particular context, like how we communicate those as well. So that when we're talking to folks, we, it's not just a, it's not just a conversation, but like here, here are some of the outputs um, from this work just kind of made me think about that while you were talking, Melissa. Um, James, I'm going to have you introduce yourself if that's okay with you. Yeah. Hi, uh, James Howison. So uh, I'm on the faculty at the University of Texas at Austin uh, in the School of Information. I am a social scientist who can do a little bit of programming, read some code. Uh, so I have been studying people building code together uh, for quite some time. Um, so I say things like, hey, look, people put layers of code on top of other people's layers of code. Is that what we mean by modularity or is that a different type of collaboration? Uh, I'm also been studying scientists where I you know, originally said things like, hey, the incentives are all screwed up. I wonder if we can find software inside publications to help people build their case for scientific impact. Uh, and so I've been plugging away at that for a few years with uh, Patrice Lopez and Katha Graham uh, looking at uh, the soft site uh, thing. So it created a data set there of software citations in papers. Uh, and, you know, now trying to blast, trying to heat up the planet by blasting through all the open access papers to convert them to usable XML uh, with software entities uh, included in them as well. Um, I'm also really, really interested uh, in uh, what I call ecosystems, by which I mean the uh, dependencies between packages and how work moves around uh, within those ecosystems. Thank you, James. It's good to have you here. And it's good to see you. I'm going to be in Austin in about 10 days, by the way. So. Oh, cool. Swimming, swimming jazz or? Dropping them off. Uh, oh, sweet. All right. Well, uh, let me know. I'll be in town. Yeah, if I have time, I'll, I'll send you a note. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think I'm going to be out of town for SciPy uh, later in the summer. Um, but because uh, I seem to miss that every year because I'm like, hey, it's hot. Why are you people coming to town? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, the hotels are cheap, I would suspect. True, true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Awesome. Um, all right. So, you know, I think maybe that this is helpful. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think one of the things I'm looking at Vanessa and Melissa at this point, so um, that we had kind of talked about with, you know, respect to these meetings, I think part of what we should start doing at this point is as people join, that's great. And they can just start participating in the conversations that are already occurring. So as we are building now metrics and metrics models, I think we're getting a pretty clear sense of what we want to do. Um, would you would you two be okay with leading the next meeting? You know, like just things that you want to, to build out. And we have a list we can go to below, but you know, things we can work on in, in this meeting, we can use meeting time like right here to actually work on say welcomingness, you know, questions around say welcomingness or questions. And we can do that today too, but you know, whatever it is that is kind of top of, of your mind, um, I think we're all here to help in that process. And if, if, if you'd be okay kind of starting us out, that would be really helpful. I think at, at this point for me and maybe for a few others on this call as well, would that be okay with the two of you? I know we had talked about this in the past, and I think we've been kind of spending this time like finding the overlap between what you want to do and what we can provide. I think we're we're there, um, so I think now we could just start really taking a look at at what y'all want to what y'all want to develop and what y'all want to deploy, and questions that you want to answer in your particular communities. So I'm seeing nods, so I'll take that as a yeah. <laughs> now that yes, works can... for me. Yeah. Okay, that'd be great. And I know that, you know, all of us have a, a lot of interest here uh, as well. So um, Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to give you just kind of an update. We, like I said, we started out the University OSPO working group with OSPO++. I don't know how familiar you are with the efforts with OSPO++. Um, but this is a, a pretty big push. I know the Sloan Foundation has been a big funder of building out OSPOs at universities, um, even 
in the last year, particularly. The call that we had um, with the university OSPOs was really around, you know, how they can do tech translation, um, how they can help the, the faculty members think more community-wise with respect to open source, more than just a, you know, open source by license kind of thing. Um, but one of the one of the things that came up there, and I'd like to just bring it up here as well, because it's come up in this group, is how do we communicate with funders? So like, how do we, as, as many of us are, are interacting with funders, so whether it's CZI or Sloan or Ford or whomever it might be, like, what are the metrics that are useful in that regard? Um, and so it, I'm thinking it might make sense at some point down the road that we invite folks like Dario or like Josh to these meetings. And instead of us kind of guessing what they might be looking for from that perspective, we simply ask them what they look for from a from an open source metrics perspective or things that might um, kind of signal success, not whether it's on, on funding, you know, making funding decisions or how to understand uh, the projects that they have funded, you know, like kind of the ongoing projects. So I don't know what you all think about that, but that did seem to be a point of overlap between the two working groups, at least at this point. I think that would make a lot of sense. And I think, uh, I'm not sure if the, I believe they would have the same issues, which is a lot of funders now are asking for that kind of metrics, uh, or at least looking at that when they decide funding. And the concern is that they will end up prioritizing technical work over community work because that is easier to measure, right? So um, how can we either develop the right metrics for them to be able to evaluate our work in non-technical uh, side of, of community work and that kind of stuff, and also how to communicate that this is tricky. Um, and it's not easy to to give the results as easily. Does that make sense? I don't I know if that's something that, that came yeah, up. It makes total sense. So maybe we could standardize this. I think that was the hope at the universities that we could think about metrics in the same way. But as part of that, ensuring that that standardization isn't all just around issue response time or, or uh, you know, the number of PRs kind of thing, <laughs> you know, I think is what you're saying. And I, I totally, totally agree. So to, as part of that standardization, um, be part of that conversation. Has anybody spoken with funders at all? I'm just kind of curious in terms of what they do look for. I don't know that I really ever have, to be honest with you. I mean, we've, we've spoken with the, just, uh, what is it called? Re not text, uh, the, the Google Foundation. I can't remember um, the Schmidt Foundation, I think, but they plain go text. by another name. Plain text. Plain text. Thank you. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, it it might be nice to kind of organize that. Um, I'm thinking if there is an overlap, I'm not quite sure what the best way to organize those conversations would be. I'd rather not have them here and at the University OSPO working group. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd rather just have them in one location where we can all, and because I, I think the, a lot of the funders are overlapping as well. Yeah. Okay. Does it make sense? Uh, that is that something that you do like from time to time, organize these joint meetings, like joining the two groups and finding the time to talk together? Because that, I yep. think that's a possibility. So uh, no, but yes. So oh, the, the reason is no, because um, the University OSPO working group is is as old as this one. So like where did it just started. <laughs> uh, the the to-do group, uh, the working group we have with the to-do group with respect to, you know, the corporate OSPOs, that one's a bit older. Um, and so no, I, I to, but so then to your point, I think it um, is a really good idea to have ways to share what's occurring in one and where there might be overlap and then coordinating a session around those shared agenda items where we can all kind of learn together. 
I think I think yeah. uh, J- James is working with uh, Karthik Graham and Nick Weber at Washington. Karthik's at UC Berkeley on a pretty interesting project related to open source scientific software that um, might help get a sense of the landscape beyond what we've talked about or might be aware of in this group so far. So I just I wanted to bring that up uh, after I checked with James that it was OK. <laughs> yeah. Is that the work led? I think uh, Fernando Perez is at Berkeley working with that group, right? Uh, I kind of think and Fernando may may do some stuff together, uh, but Fernando is not not directly involved in, oh, okay. in the software mentions stuff. Yeah, sorry, I was just wondering. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, Fernando and I have had some pretty interesting conversations about um, academic evaluation. So hiring and tenure case writing um, that that I think is, you know, gets at interesting questions of of different incentives. But um, but yeah, no, he's not involved in this stuff. James, are you involved in any of the OSPO, University OSPO stuff? As yeah, well? well, it's funny you mentioned that. So we have a proposal in, in at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. So I actually have another call this afternoon to finalize a response to okay. reviews. Uh, so hopefully we'll have a university OSPO at the University of Texas uh, okay. soon. <laughs> Maybe we won't. Don't, not sure. <laughs> Looks good. Are you and you're part of that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was actually pretty interesting how that came together. So you know, the call came out, and I was like, right, yes, I really need to more things because they activate yeah. here, right? I mean, it, there's no research money in it for me, but so I put together a group that was largely people I knew that were doing open source work. Uh, so like people actually running projects and things. Uh, and as is sometimes the case at big universities, you know, about uh, like a week and a half out from the submission deadline, we discovered there was another group that had been bubbling away an OSPO proposal uh, that was more kind of VPR's office uh, and TAC. And they were really focused, uh, interestingly enough, on what they were calling like future-proofing development on campus. Um, mm-hmm. so that, that was much more of a, like open source kind of internal practices, um, and how you can avoid having to like recover student work, uh, you know, three years later, things like that. So the, those groups were sort of mushed together, which was a really interesting and instructive, uh, you know, experience. Um, and, uh, it, it hasn't been, it hasn't worked out too badly, um. Interestingly enough, like the the kind of I guess what is maybe a slightly novel focus of, of this OSPO is going to be around containerization, both the running of code in containers, but also development containers as a way of getting people quickly up and able to work with uh, to work with the code. Um, so that's something slightly different. That's interesting. Yeah, that mm-hmm. is kind of unique. I have not heard that before. Yeah, at first I was quite resistant to it because I was like, well, <laughs> that's all just about running code, not about building code. But then I've gotten more educated on uh, development <laughs> containers. On why that's oh. important. Okay. Yeah. I love, all right. I love that word, educated. Yeah. Well, man, there was some there was some confusing conversations, uh, you know, at first. So okay. Um, so I, I, I think it'll be, if you, I mean, if, if that does go well, it'd be great to have you join the university OSPO. We have a lot of folks from Carnegie and from Johns Hopkins and, um, RIT and Santa Cruz, kind of the, you know, you know, those folks, I think. Yeah. I mean, I, I will be part of it, but I'll also try to get, you know, the yeah. staff, like the PI. Um, so we're going to have, hopefully we'll have like the PI is going to be someone who's in central IT, kind of a research computing role, uh, mm-hmm. and then a co-PI from from TAC, and then also a uh, reproducibility librarian at the library uh, okay. that we need to hire. Uh, so I hope that those, you know, those people would get involved there as well. Okay. Count those That's chickens good. when they uh, when they hatch. Yeah, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I do see this, Sean. I'm guessing you put that on there the IBM work yeah there's um when I was at open, open, yeah when I was at open source summit North America last week uh, I had a, a number of discussions with uh, IBM folks and Red Hat folks about this 
new initiative that I had not heard about before. Uh, it seems very adjacent to the work that um, James and Karthik are doing, um, as as well as the work of, of, you know, we are obviously focused on a kind of a narrow piece of the metrics definitions and looking at health and sustainability. Um, but, but it seems to be operating uh, outside of the existing network of folks doing scientific work in, in large measure. Although Michelle Barker from RISA um, and Daniel Katz um, from, from RISA uh, are involved in it. So, so those are a couple of other folks uh, and organizations that are, Daniel's part of the for, FAIR for Software initiative um, as well. So, so there are these adjacent projects that, that we're not directly connected with, although I have um, spent a good deal of time with um, Michelle and Dan uh, over the last couple of years, understanding the scientific open source space from their perspective. Um, this was new uh, to me, uh, and, and so I thought I'd uh, just bring it forward because I think it's relevant to this group. I, I have no assessments or opinions or sense of how or to what extent to integrate with this group, um, but it looks like they were at Pi Data um, <laughs> in April. So, so um, I think I can see that that it's a NumFocus uh, partnership, and we did get Anissa. I think you may have seen that as well. There's uh, someone from this group that wants to meet us at SciPy. Um, oh yes, uh, Tim, NumPy Tim maintainers. Bonham. Yes, exactly. Yes. That's that's the same group, right? Correct. So this initiative of well, this partnership with NumFocus and the initiative or SI was launched at the last Sci-Fi conference, and I got an opportunity to speak to Alexei Hrabrov, who is one of the facilitators uh, from IBM. Yes, and then they are going to they're coming to the to this year's SciPy conference. And currently they're looking for someone to step in into the role of a community manager, I think. We, we have been talking to them. It would be great to have them on board. They, they are not specifically focusing on community health at this point. It's more of mapping out all the currently existing scientific computing uh, scientific uh, open source projects and maybe making the point that do we need to fund yet another new open source scientific project mm. yes but so i think it, at some point they will get to the to, to the conversation about how do we evaluate these projects are they like, active i am worth including including to the roadmap um or not was it sean who had the question yeah i mean i think i i just wanted to, to bring bring awareness to this discussion of, of this group and express my own lack of knowledge about what it's actually about despite talking with a few folks um because it, because there are sort of parallel initiatives like james and karthik's work um as well as you know this working group and the work that um chaos has been doing with CZI over the last three or four years, of course, CZI itself. Um, and it would be, you know, it would be nice to see a, a, a sort of a shared form of organization, um, or at least some co awareness and collaboration, um, so that we can help scientific open source software together. That, that would be my optimistic ideal, um, but I, I'm not sure how to, I, I don't know where to begin because I don't know the people or have a deep knowledge of the organization either. Is this part of NumFocus? Yes. It seems like it is implying that it is, but okay. So yes. Yeah. The folks I talked with at OSSNA were all IBMers, so they weren't NumFocus people. I don't know if that means that IBM is just a big corporate contributor or 
Um, but so I don't know. I, I don't. I don't fully understand the relationship between Nunfocus and IBM uh, and how to plug in or collaborate because obviously we've we've actually looked at these projects and worked with some of you as well. And of course, James and Karthik are pretty deep in in a project that's looking at scientific open source and publications and scientific credit and whatnot. Or perhaps we could invite Alex and Tim on this call and kind of see yeah. if there are yeah. any points for collaboration. I, yeah. I think that's a no, that's great idea. And then to your point, Anessa, I mean, if theirs is about mapping the space initially, that would be, that's, that's a job unto itself. Yeah. Um, and then, right, the questions about health or survivability or viability might be further down the road. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks, and I'll, thanks for I'll, I'll, Yeah, if their goal is mapping, um, James and Karthik and Matt and I talked about that at CCI probably three years ago now. Um, we just couldn't get money. <laughs> <laughs> well, this partnership with Numfocus is it's a grant from IBM to to, to create a database. Of, of the existing scientific uh, scientific projects, not specific to Python. And as I know they chose one specific area of science, but my memory is failing what it is. So probably, I can... lo probably life sciences. That's where a lot of the open source do, science. Do you, know what their, do you know what their method is for building that out? No. Yeah. Right. And I guess the other question is, why do they think a database is going to be helpful? Because... How about we get them on the call and ask yeah, us? Yeah, yeah. Great <laughs> questions. I... Databases are always helpful, James. We can solve yeah. everything with a database. If that's, if that's right. I mean, I, I, Augur's a database, so I, I am talking out of both sides of my mouth right now. <laughs> yeah, in so this I... context, it often it's often, you know, one of the things people talk about doing is saying, well, we need a list of all the of all the software. So I'm just wondering whether that's part of this or not. And then when you when you push into well, why do we need a list of all the software? Was that well, people need to find, you know, the relevant software. Um, <laughs> it's I don't know. I I don't see a lot of data that people who are deep in a research topic have difficulty finding the tools that can help them get their work done. Yeah. I've done a few focus groups on that question, but if if you see if you guys see data that kind of really speaks to that question of like, is discovery really a difficult question? I'd, I'd be really interested in it. I'm I'm obviously a little bit skeptical, but I'm actually really open to to data on it. But I don't even know if that's what they're if if they're arguing yeah. that discovery is 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 the issue here. Well, and as a as a former R developer turned Python developer, there is no better find place. CRAN is the best searchable scientific software database I've ever been through. Um, I can find all 11 projects that do what I want to do and choose among them um, in CRAN pretty easily. But that's only that only serves the R community, obviously. OK, this is good. So I, I'm guessing, Anessa, you're writing this as the anonymous pumpkin. To an anonymous. I love yeah. I love these names. I want to be an anonymous to platypus it. sometime, but you don't get to pick. To ask, you know, to ask questions and identify potential points of collaboration might be yeah. helpful for all of us. Um, okay, great. Um, so I, I'd like to spend maybe just the last fifteen minutes here taking a look at. At kind of our mission work, and I think, or the the mission statement we have, I do think this still needs a little bit of work. Um, I think it's good at the beginning. So um, the the link here is in the minutes about kind of what we're trying to accomplish here when we start getting into supporting leadership and maintainers. So really, essentially, what we did was we broke this out into three different areas, if you recall. So the goals for metrics, this is kind of like why we want metrics and metrics models. And it's one is to communicate with leadership and maintainers. 
Um, and then the other is to communicate with community members. Both of those are, from my perspective, internal to the project. The maintainers, the kind of the, the as well as the members, um, I, it doesn't feel like we have a goal around communicating to other projects and that might be okay. I just wanna make sure that that's clear and, and maybe what we communicate with leadership and maintainers and community members is exactly the same stuff you know, that we would communicate with other projects. And then that last one, the communicate with funders where I had talked about the overlap with uh, university OSPO work. And so within here, you know, we started kind of, I think, just brainstorming on a few ideas as to what are things that we would like to do with respect to maintainers and leaders and then community members. This is where we started talking about DEI related issues and then funders. We really haven't gotten there yet. And I think maybe that one could be accelerated by just bringing funders to the conversation, kind of like invi inviting them and just listening to them talk. So we're not guessing. Um, so with respect to these, um, I'm okay with just having this structured as it is right now. Um, are there particular areas that are most pressing, Melissa and Anessa, for you with respect to kind of gaps that you're having in terms of conversations where, you know, metrics might help, whether it's around, like you had mentioned, like welcomingness or whether it's around community activity you know, like, are there, are there areas where you feel like you're frustrated? Not friendly, you know what I mean? Like, you, yeah. you wish you had more to, to bring to the conversation. Um, I think there's a number of those, but I would say the highest priority, I think there's a couple of things. One is, and I know this is not exactly the question, but on a more general note is bringing visibility to this kind of work, to invisible work, mostly focused on community community building, you know, um, onboarding new people and that kind of stuff that can easily fall through the cracks when you're looking at metrics. Uh, so it's more about bringing visibility to, to this work. And I would say the second thing is, yeah, making sure that we do this in a way that is fair, uh, you know, based on consent from people. I don't, I have zero experience on like data collection, data uh, usage, and you know uh, privacy stuff, and all of that. I, I'm I'm a little concerned by that kind of stuff, like the, the, using data from the community members. I know a lot of our community members are very skeptical when it comes to metrics and to data collection, and you know. We have like, I'll give you a very clear example for SciPy. If you do any metrics on like the gender of the maintainers, there is one woman maintainer, which is me. And so immediately <laughs> I'm identifiable. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that kind of stuff is going to come up multiple times where it's like the data is so small that you're immediately able to identify people. So uh, I, that's a concern that I have with re respect to dealing with data. I have okay. a question. Uh, yeah. So yeah. if you're dealing with the data and the data is open to anyone, like it is in the open spaces, so that cannot be hidden. Like, for example, you are the only maintainer, but uh, uh, that data is publicly available. Even I can just scrap the project and find out. So uh, how, like, what are the concerns is like hiding the, those data or like, uh, I'm trying to assess the concerns that that flags those. Yeah, I think just like a lot of people will say, you know, scraping your Mastodon posts is not cool and you shouldn't do that unless you ask for consent from people. Uh, similar questions could arise as, as in like scraping GitHub data from people might not... I'm saying we need to express that, we need to communicate that with our community, make sure that they understand, you know, they should understand that whatever data they post on GitHub is public, but at the same time, uh, just communicating that in a way that is um, we, I, respectful I could, of the community. I, I do, I can't say, and I don't have a link right in front of me, we do have a data privacy policy as part of chaos. Um, the metrics that we develop 
through chaos are also aggregated metrics looking at project health. So we don't have metrics that are ranking developers or doing that kind of thing, which is, I think, what makes people the most nervous. That said, of course, if somebody installs one of our pieces of software and wants to do that analysis, they can. Because in order to provide summary metrics, you have to have the underlying details. Um, and in order to link identities, you have to have the public identities that are available through the APIs and the Git logs. Um, and of course, you probably know that even if I, if we, even if we anonymize the names and emails in the Git logs, the they can be reverse engineered from the Git hash on each commit, um, which is a, a longstanding known defect in Git. Uh, so our value system is clearly to protect the privacy uh, of people. Um, but we, we recognize that uh, it's bad actors can use the things that we build uh, to do bad things. And um, ho hopefully our house software is, you know, our software is easier to install now than it used to be. Maybe that's a problem. <laughs> And, and and I think I, I absolutely agree with all that. And I think it's mostly about communicating, making sure that people know that. And, you know, um, I see that as a an important thing that should be, for example, should be in the group mission statement, probably, that we are going to do this in accordance with, you know, the privacy statement from chaos and that we are following best practices when it comes to anonymizing. And of course, this is not, perfect, but we're doing the best we can, um, that kind of stuff. I don't know. I'm I'm bringing this as like, it's I'm a very a important newbie. concern. I'm a newbie in this space and I see people talking about it and I understand their concerns. And so I'm, I'm just bringing it up as I see it. <laughs> so Melissa, is, is what you're talking about, like trying to recognize the work of all of your community members? Like when you're talking about bringing the invisible, or you know, bringing visibility to the invisible work, because it is easy to see some contributors. Or it's easier to see some contributors. So is that what this is about for you? Like seeing the work of everybody somehow? Yeah, I think there's a few experiments with that that I know exist. For example, there's this all contributors bot uh, yep. you probably heard about. So. Yep. We'll bring people in and you can include them in the commit history for the project. Uh, yep. The problem is the minute you do some kind of ranking, just like GitHub does on your, you know, contributors uh, list of people, it will rank you by number of commits. And someone who has one commit with the all contributor bot will get pushed to the bottom, even if they are hosting every community meeting for the project. So it will create this artificial ranking between people that we would like to advise against. So I, I, freak, I, I don't think that's healthy to to do that kind of ranking at all. Like ideally, we don't even need that. Um, but it is something that exists, and so I think I, I would like to be very clear about hey, what we're doing here does not have the intent of capturing the entirety of what happens in the project, that it's not going to be totally representative of everything that happens. It's just what we can measure, right? Yep. Um, and so from your perspective, for the communities that you're involved in, I mean, do you, because we, we have thought about some of these things in the chaos project, and we're actually doing some project project level DEI work, for example, with GitHub. Um, but, you know, we're, the position that you're in, are you comfortable kind of doing that extra work? Because sometimes understanding how people contribute, um, it requires moving away from GitHub <laughs> altogether and, and recognizing people in the different places where they're at within the community. You know, Because if we want to go down this, this road, I, I think that's great, um, but it, it will take, you know, whatever the efforts, the extra efforts might be, um, and is that something you're looking to do? I would say that's the next step for us. I, I would say okay. that's what we want to do. I, I know there's a number of projects already working on things like this and like recognizing contributors and in other yeah. spaces that not GitHub and 
having roles and titles and awards and you know different ways to recognize and give credit to people um and i think that's the direction we're looking at okay um elizabeth do you have the dei md file really handy you can grab it really quick or somebody or kevin i just shared the link oh, yeah. to uh chaos's contribution <laughs> attribution metric which was written in partnership with the uh uh i'm sorry which project is that uh Oh. Was that Drupal? Yeah, the the Drupal community. Yeah, uh, and they are they are very. It's very interesting how they provide uh, contribution attribution. So they they do a really good job of it. Uh, and they actually they came into chaos and, and worked with us to help us actually create this metric. Uh, so if you uh, if you're interested in kind of looking at some really kind of interesting and innovative way innovative ways that uh that a community can kind of handle that contribution attribution i suggest uh looking at the drupal community yeah, that's sounds, very helpful that sounds great i hear lots of uh, great things coming out of the drupal community and uh, the, having this case study is very helpful i must say it is a uh, a bit of a struggle for us to introduce any metrics in the SciPy community because any even remote hint at telemetry or what resembles telemetry is not uh, is very is not yeah. welcomed by our active com community members. So having these case studies where other open source communities successfully implemented certain community health metrics, especially right. in the setting where there was some pushback, but the, the, the work still moved forward, forward. That would be very helpful for Melissa and myself in by, the work that we're doing now. But by, by telemetry, do, do you mean, I'm just trying to coordinate with words I think of as, do you mean like surveillance similarly? Well, I'm not sure I know that I just want to understand the distinction. Any 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 collection of metrics is yeah. basically identify this telemetry. Okay, okay. So having this case studies where the community was not very supportive at first, but introducing policies and being transparent about data collection and data storage. Uh, allowed the community to move forward and adopt some community health metrics. And I just, uh, I know we are short on time. So there's something that I mentioned at the last meeting and I wish to follow up today. I am heading to Seattle for the Scientific Python Project Summit on Sunday. And I will be working with several SciPy project leaders whole week on a variety of initiatives of tasks that we identified. And one of them is community building, uh, policy making, governance, and also measuring our efforts, whatever it might be. So I would appreciate some guidance on what could be the maybe the initial metrics to introduce in our conversation, maybe something that, again, we uh, you you tried in other communities, in, in other settings, maybe, as I understand, the academic uh, OSPO working group is a little further ahead in their work, maybe something that they agreed. And that could be, it, this metrics would be a sort of a starting point of the conversation of, for, for us at the Developer Summit. And uh, with that in mind, I also had a brief conversation on a dashboard that we could set up as a sort of uh, MVP, uh, you know, viable product. And we would like to try it out with Orger Labs. We yeah. have access to Biturgia, but there is a, I know we have been recorded, sorry folks from Biturgia. <laughs> Having the source code closed is not uh, flying very far for, <laughs> with, uh, with the 
the Fox and our community. So we would like to try it out with a, a project that is open source and Orga Labs seems to have done a lot of work and Sean, we know you. So we would like to have a MVP probably for NumPy because most likely yeah. I will be the one who will be doing it to, to see again, how it works if other project leaders like it and take it there's, from there. There is a public instance of Augur available now where you can actually log in and create your own repos and groups. But what I'll do is um, add NumPy. I'll add, I'll just add all the NumFocus um, projects to a group called NumFocus and um, start that collection now and it should be ready by the time you meet next, uh, by the time you meet on Sunday, and I'll I'll send you uh, a link and some instructions. That would be wonderful. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, no problem. We rolled that out at ChaosCon last week, so uh, um, super excited. Sarah Kaiser, uh, she is with um, Q Q Pi. Uh, she was uh, at this presentation, and she was she's also excited to try it out for us, for our yeah. projects. We are beta, so please open issues <laughs> okay. as, as you encounter them. Well, what we are looking for, we, we've started an internal project called DevStats. It was built with GraphQL and we just don't have the bandwidth. We don't have a dedicated paid uh, staff member to work on it. And it was one, like, one person project volunteer so they were the start was great but it hasn't been updated for the past let's say six months and we are not sure if the person who started it will have the bandwidth in the future so we would like to find another project preferably open source like strong preference for open source that yeah. is Augur has a dedicated fully, team yeah yeah Augur is fully committed to always being open source um and by the way i didn't know julia was a was a num, num focus project that oh yes we have quite a few projects from the uh, julia and our communities that are also part of num focus yeah. i used to go to an r group in new york when i lived in philly and when julia came out they were just all so excited <laughs> i wasn't exactly sure why because i was so into r but um, apparently it's very nice for that kind of work. It's it's great. And <laughs> as much as my heart is with the Python community, Julia language is uh, is great for those who work in numerical analysis and data analysis. Um, and then just to, to circle back to the metrics, one metric to measure welcomeness that I am start implementing with NumPy project is second contribution. And um, oh, yep. as we, as, we have that we have that metric both on the Augur dashboard and Augur's new interface eight knot, um, which I'll I will send links out to this group after the meeting. That that would be great, but I this is the only metric that. Everyone that I spoke to seemed to be fairly comfortable with. Um, so having a few more metrics that we could have as a starting point for measuring some of the efforts of community managers and contributor experience leads in the SciPy community would be great. Are you familiar with this spreadsheet, Vanessa? No, I've never seen this document before. Oh, I have seen this before. This is from the working groups or from the yeah. development. I'm yeah, sorry, okay, I've seen metrics. this. This might be real helpful to you. So here's the link. It's a public document. And across the bottom, if you, well, I think the link I sent you will go right to the metrics models tab. And so the green are ones that we've actually deployed. And then yellow are ones that are in progress. And we do have community welcomingness here or sustaining contributors as we're calling it. We're kind of, whenever it's yellow, it changes a lot, but this might give you some, some things to think about as well with respect to welcomingness. And sometimes it can be as 
as easy as, you know, is, is a code of conduct clearly articulated and made available to the community. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't have to be as detailed as a second contribution or an attention to inclusive leadership. For example, I think this is not set in any way, shape or form, but some of these metrics models might give you some idea for metrics to think about. Can I uh, can I propose that we add that second contribution metric to the uh, to the common page as a proposed metric? Because I, I don't I believe that I don't believe that exists currently. No, uh, I don't think as we've ever... in our chaos matrix. Uh, it does chaos. exist uh, on Augur. Yep. Uh, according to fair. Yep. Totally fair. And one of the reasons I want to focus on welcomeness first, while we are trying to convince our active uh, community members that some collection of data is necessary for us to be effective in our work. I want to still get some work done. And I think if the metrics are focused on the internal team, if uh, the metric is basically evaluating my effectiveness, I'm fine with that. Yeah. So that's um, the thinking behind it. It's great. Yeah. Um, well, take, yeah, take a look at these and let's, before you head out, Melissa, are you going to Seattle? No, I'm not. Okay. okay. Well, I had two thoughts. So one, Melissa uh, or Anessa, why don't, as you're, before you head out to Seattle, if you want to just talk async through Slack on things that might be helpful for you to talk about. And then Melissa, one of the things that I was thinking about is the metric I can, that- I can share the links through Slack too as well. Yeah, if that's yeah. easier. I mean, maybe the question for you, Melissa, isn't like, what are the new metrics or what are the new metrics models that we need to develop? But like, if you were to take a look at contribution, attribution, I know we're way over time, like how might you think about this in your context? You know, like, and that might be a really interesting discussion for next time as well. So it's not about building anything new. It's about taking what we have and, and thinking about how it might fit contextually for you. Yeah, I think I have a document that I need to find, but I, where I have like the take, took a look at the chaos metrics and kind of went one by one and selecting what would be interesting in our case. And, and I can just rehash that document and, and bring it over for cool. the next meeting. Yeah, because yeah, then maybe it's it's less about making new things, but kind of talking about the process by, by which you're you're doing yeah. this work. We can have that conversation here as well. I think we can go a variety of different directions and that'd be wonderful. All right, cool. We're way over time, people. I guess we are. <laughs> yeah, we usually don't Nine do that. minutes that is against our rules. But anyway, yeah. it's great, great talking to you. And uh, I think we'll see you all again in two weeks. All right. Yeah. Talk to you all soon. Thank enjoy, you so much. Enjoy, enjoy Thank Seattle. You, Bye. Thanks, everybody. Okay.